Buddy. Hold on, hold on. Get on on you. Josh, you told me I had two minutes. Well, you sat back. Okay, how's that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, this is a regularly scheduled Recording in progress. Um, meeting of the Shaftesbury Water Board, so I would like to open the meeting um, at 6.31. Um, the agenda for this evening is to hear about the proposed uh, engineering of the water main uh, replacements in the town of Shaftesbury. Um, so I'd like to welcome, we have a very big audience, but uh, it, it just we just haven't heard that much about it. Nobody responded to Dave or anything, so. I thought I saw some people walking here, but maybe they're just walking. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, so um, this is going out Cat TV, so hopefully they're watching it on on their televisions at the house and so on and so forth. So back in the 30s, when the water system was put in to North from North Bennington's water system was uh, we agreed upon installing our water system here, uh, tapping off from their line, and at the time, state of the art was a concrete asbestos pipe supposed to be flexible and durable and all that sort of stuff. Nothing lasts forever. So the pipe that is in the ground uh, does have a life to it. It's, we haven't dug any up uh, to see how bad it is, but we don't know if that would tell us just in that spot or the whole thing. So we've decided that we will, over the year, next several years, we will start replacing it in sections. What is the most important one is the one that's coming right down Main Street because in a couple years they are going to completely redo Route 7. The concrete base is going to be taken up and there'll be a brand new base and everything else. So they certainly don't want us cutting up their brand new blacktop road to put in a pipeline. So um, we at the point where we have hired a uh, engineering firm, uh, Dufresne, out of uh, Manchester, mm -hmm. uh, which is doing the engineering, the studying, the engineering, how it's going to be done. They are also responsible for the permits and things like that. And then we will go forward with hiring a company that will actually do it. And but uh, uh, Chris Hansen is going is here to explain uh, how it's going to be done. Uh, how we're going to make sure you always have service and everything else. So I guess we'll turn it right over to Chris and you go ahead and tell us what, what you've uh, come up with. Sure, thank you. Good evening. So um, a few years ago, an asset management plan was developed for the town's water system. That asset management plan identified that approximately 80% of the water system was constructed of asbestos cement water main. And um, tonight you'll hear me abbreviate that as AC, water main. Um, the asset management plan identified three phases of replacement projects to eliminate the aging AC pipe. Uh, we are currently in final design of phase one, which includes replacement of approximately 4,170 feet of eight inch AC water main on Route 7A, Church Street and Route 67. So on 7A, this is the sole water main from, um, for at least a portion of it, it's the sole water main from no the North Beddington system to the Shaftesbury system. Um, a preliminary engineering report was completed by Dufresne Group in 2020 to identify the need, evaluate alternatives, and make recommendations for the project. Um, so what we came up with for need is that it's an aging pipe. Um, it's uh, installed in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then there's also a local goal to eliminate AC pipe in the water system. And um, as I just noted, this is a critical water main uh, high priority project. There are some constraints with this project. It's um, along 7A and 67, it's in the state right of way. And in the state right of way, you cannot work within the travel lanes. Uh, you can't install pipes within the travel la lanes. Um, there's also a fairly new sidewalk along the west side of 7A, um, so 
another sidewalk and utility poles on the east side of 7A, sidewalks on Church Street. Um, the existing right-of-way is a constraint, minimizing um, the need for easements on private property. And then the state paving project on 7A in 2024 as a schedule constraint. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so approximately, um, as you just noted, 80% of the water system is AC pipe. So AC pipe is today known to be a hazardous material. It was found to be an inhalation danger in the 1950s. Um, it was a popular pipe material for water and sewer systems in the mid 1900s. And there are currently over 600,000 miles of AC pipe installed in North America. AC pipe has an approximate useful life of about 70 years, um, although some sources do um, fluctuate to about 50 years. The pipe can soften over time, which results in a loss of strength, and this can lead to increased water main breaks. AC pipe is a Category 2 non-friable ACM, which stands for asbestos-containing material. This means that when it's dry, it cannot be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by your hand pressure. So if you pick up a clump of dirt and you squeeze it with your hand and it breaks apart, um, AC pipe won't do that. Um, the, there are special handling and disposal requirements due to the hazardous nature of the material. All asbestos must be handled in accordance with the Vermont regulations for asbestos control which provide requirements for handling, transporting, and disposal. AC pipe handling and disposal tends to increase the cost of a project. Abandoned AC pipe must be removed and properly disposed of in open trench areas. Uh, handling and removal may require uh, state permits. Standard water industry practices are outlined in the AWWA Work Practices for AC Pipe. That stands for American Water Works Association. Um, and these include keeping the pipe wet, no dust producing activities, such as sawing, sanding, drilling, uh, removing in large sections, um, packaging label labeling in accordance with the Clean Air Act, um, and transport and disposal in accordance with state requirements. And there are only one or two local, not, not even local, um, one or two locations that you can dispose of this material at. Um, what are the average costs to get rid of that material? Do you know? Um, off the top of my head, I don't have that price. You know if they had a weight or anything they go by. Um, I don't know what it, what they charge at the uh, at the landfill facilities to get rid of it. Okay. Um, it is by, um, I think it's by cubic yard. Okay, by the yard. By. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you can go to the next. So the preliminary engineering report evaluated four installation method alternatives for the replacement of the water main. Open trench is a typical installation method. Directional drilling and pipe bursting are both trenchless replacement methods. And cured in place pipe, which we call CIPP, is a trenchless rehabilitation method. Um, so in the interest of keeping this fairly brief, I wasn't planning on going into detail on these methods, but I can talk about it if anybody is interested. We will talk about pipe bursting. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, re the preliminary engineering report also evaluated potential alignment constraints, which um, I summarized um, earlier. Um, and so the evaluation of the installation methods included a variety of parameters, such as AC handling, alignment cost, duration, um, disturbed areas, and environmental impacts. Pipe bursting was the highest ranked installation method. So we also evaluated different types of pipe materials. Typical materials for water main are ductile iron, HDPE, and C900 PVC. So um, ductile iron has a uh, highest cost out of the three materials. Um, you see uh, HDPE is the lowest cost, and C900 is slightly above HDPE. Um, ductile is by far the most expensive. The estimated service life um, is typically 75 years for ductile iron. However, this can be extended to 100 plus with poly wrap and or zinc coating, which are different ways to protect the pipe. Um, 
both the plastic pipes are um, 100 years, 100 plus. Um, the um, open trench feasibility and trenchless feasibility, so ductile can be used, all three of these can be used in, in either um, option, open or trenchless. Uh, ductile is uh, very feasible in open trench. It's the typical material that's used for open trench. Um, it is not as feasible for trenchless. Um, the, the, the installers typically don't like to use it because of the increased weight, um, which requires larger size equipment to um, install trenchless. HDPE is um, actually not uh, preferred by open trench contractors because it comes in 40 foot lengths. It's very flexible, so it's kind of hard to um, handle it on site. But it is the preferred uh, material for trenchless installation because of its flexibility. Um, it's lightweight um, and its price. And then C900 PVC, open trench, it is um, very similar to ductile. It can be installed the exact same way. It can fit with all the same fittings. Um, it's a little bit, it's got a lower cost. It's lighter. Um, so contractors are very happy to use it. Um, in the trenchless world, it is, um, it's not as preferred as HDPE because it has a, um, it, it doesn't have as tight of a bending radius as HDPE. So it requires, um, a little bit larger excavation areas. Um, but it can be used, it can, it's actually used as fusible PVC in the trenchless, um, industry. Hydraulic wise, um, in, uh, terms of, uh, for ductile, it's always, it's been the preferred water main historically, so it tends to set the scale for hydraulics. Um, in comparison to AC pipe, um, ductile iron of the same nominal size will provide slightly improved hydraulics. Um, HDPE is, um, has a smaller inside diameter when compared to ductile, um, PVC and AC of the same nominal diameter. So it often requires upsizing to maintain the hydraulic capacity. And then C900 is, um, very similar to ductile again, in that it would have a, at the same nominal diameter, it would have a, um, improved hydraulics compared to AC. Um, an installer preference, um, so open trench is ductile, trenchless is HDPE, and C900 is both, but not the absolute preferred material on either one. So our evaluation resulted in an almost tie between HDPE and C900. Um, PVC was slightly higher in the rankings in the preliminary engineering report. However, HDP, HDPE was selected due to the lower cost. So we can go to the next. So pipe bursting. It's a proven method of replacing an existing pipe with a new pipe of the same or larger diameter. This is accomplished by pulling a hardened steel splitting head through the old pipe. The new pipe is attached to the back of the splitting head and is pulled in as the old pipe is split and expanded. The new pipe follows the path of the old one and lies in its place. So basically you take the existing AC pipe and you run through it a cutter head, and I have pictures of all this, uh, a cutter head and an expander head, and it just takes that pipe, it cracks it open on the top, it cuts it on the top, and just cracks it open and pushes it away. So um, pipe bursting sounds really exciting, but it's not nearly as exciting as it sounds to watch. <laughs> um, there's nothing exploding, nothing's actually bursting. It breaks apart into large fragments. Um, there are two types of pipe bursting, static and pneumatic. Static is typically used for water main replacement and pneumatic is typically used for sewer main replacement. Um, so in static bursting, the new pipe is pulled through by running rods out through the existing pipe and then they just steadily pull the new pipe through. Um, whereas pneumatic would be like hitting a hammer. So the little pictures up in the top right corner of the um, presentation, you can see the one on the left with the hammer um, image is pneumatic, um, whereas the other, the one on the right there is static. So the next uh, few slides show some photos. So on the left there, that's a pipe receiving pit. So that's where the equipment goes, the bursting 
equipment would go in that pit. You can see there's a trench box in there. So those are typically about six foot wide by 20 foot long to accommodate the trench box. And the bursting machine gets set down in there. Now under that excavator bucket, you can see two steel beams sticking out. Those steel beams are driven down into the ground and that's what the bursting machine pushes against. Um, I don't know what size that one is in that picture, but the one that we used in Bells Falls was a 100 ton bursting machine. So it's got quite a bit of force that it's um, pulling, that it can pull. And so it uses those steel beams um, to anchor it. And then the picture on the right is the pipe insertion pit. That pipe in particular, that black pipe there that you see is an HDPE. And you can see the bending radius. It comes up over that roller and right down into the pit. Um, and part of that pit is actually covered by a steel plate, so you can't see the full thing. And go to the next one. In this one, um, the picture on the left is the fusible PVC. That's the blue pipe there. And you can see two blue wires there on top of it. Those are the trace wires. Um, we would use those with either PVC or HDPE. Um, and those would allow us to locate the pipe in the future once it's buried, once it's all installed, everything's all backfilled. Um, we can, uh, we'll have points at which these wires come up um, to the surface and they can attach tracing equipment to them and locate the pipe. The um, middle picture there is, you can see the bottom part of the picture is the actual um, insertion pit and then the, as you move up the picture, that's the tail ditch. So that's, um, that's the slope to get the pipe out of there without um, damaging it due to bending it too much. So with a PVC pipe, you need a longer tail ditch than with an HDPE pipe. And then on the right side, you can see there we have the pipe laid out along the road. So I think in that case, that was about a 300 foot pole. And so there's 300 feet of fused PVC pipe there laid out along the side of the road. The bursting head is connected to the, to the front of the pipe. And then on the very bottom of the picture is the cutter, cutter bar. So you can go to the next one. Um, this is just a little schematic of the insertion pit. Um, so on the bottom there, you can kind of see the profile, the section of what it would look like. Um, so you see the pipe coming along from the left side on above grade, it's on rollers, it drops down into the tail ditch and then down into the pit. Um, and on the right side, you can see the existing um, pipe in there and everything will just get pulled right through that existing pipe. Go to the next one. This is the tooling. The picture on the left is the cutter bar. So that's what goes in first and it um, has three progressively larger uh, cutting wheels and it cuts the pipe on the top. And then the picture on the right is the expander head. Um, so that's what pushes the pipe out and away from the new pipe that's going to be coming in. These are photos from our Bellows Falls project. So um, the left one, you can see that's the, um, that's a uh, uh, receiving pit. So that's where the machine goes. So that's what it looks like from above ground. Um, there are, there's, there's kind of a lot of stuff around it right there and they haven't cleaned it up too much yet, but um, you can see the steel beams coming out. The picture on the right, you can see the machine in there. That's the hundred ton pulling machine. Um, and then the next is, um, that's the cutter bar and the expander head um, entering into the existing AC pipe. I would have done videos, but they're quite large in size. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, so this is the top view of the um, bursting machine on the left. Um, so you can see there's kind of that Right in the middle of it, running um, side to side across the page, you can see a kind of a black um, bar with little rectangular holes in it. Those are the rods that uh, get attached to the expander head um, and pull the pipe back. And so the machine uses those little rectangular um, holes and it just puts a little steel piece up in between them and pulls it back. And then it drops back down, grabs another hole and pulls it back again. So it's about, um, I think it's like two to three foot sections that it just pulls in. The picture on the right, you can see the guys in the white suits there. 
um, they're cleaning up all the AC fragments, um, all the asbestos pipe fragments. Um, so when they pull it into the pit, or into that receiving pit, once it actually gets there, um, that last piece of AC pipe that was in there actually doesn't burst at all. It actually just gets pushed into the pit. Um, and then these guys go in and bag it all up and pick up all the fragments and get it all cleaned up. So now is the fun part, asbestos regulations. Um, so there was a letter back in 1991. Um, the EPA was asked about crushing excavated AC pipe in place with mechanical equipment. So the letter they wrote was in response to that inquiry. Um, so the question um, was, could they crush excavated AC pipe in place with mechanical equipment and backfill or bury it? Um, would that be acceptable to the EPA? So the EPA did not deny the request. Um, that is actually probably the most important part of that letter is they never actually denied the request. Um, they provided information regarding regulatory requirements and strongly encouraged alternatives. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people took that letter to mean the EPA was denying the request, but they never did. So what they did say was the crushing of asbestos cement pipe with mechanical equipment would cause this material to become RACM, which is regulated asbestos containing material. So the difference between the asbestos containing material that we talked about before, where you can't break it with your hand, you can't pulverize it or crumble it with your hand, um, regulated asbestos containing material is friable asbestos material or non-friable ACM that has been or will be subject to sanding, grinding, cutting, or braiding, or has crumbled or been pulverized or reduced to powder in the course of demolition or renovation operations. Um, so basically it is regulated AC pipe that can be further reduced to powder by hand. So most people who work with AC pipe know that it is very difficult to reduce AC pipe to powder in your hand. So it tends to be a significant disagreement between the pipe bursting and utility industries and the EPA, um, the argument between ACM versus RACM. Um, and that's a really important part of the EPA's determination on all of this. Um, so the other thing they said was the backfilling and burial of the crushed asbestos cement pipe in place would cause these locations to be considered active waste disposal sites and therefore subject to the requirements in 61.154. So that is the National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutants, otherwise known as NESHAP. Um, that's the asbestos section of that code. So this letter is still referred to today. Um, the EPA... Um, when we did our Bellas Falls project, the EPA still discouraged pipe bursting, but it never officially denied a request. Um, and most of the, uh, throughout most of the country, the EPA delegates this decision to the states. Um, since we did our Bellas Falls project, the EPA has formally approved a pipe bursting of AC pipe project. Um, I think it just happened a, a couple of years ago. Um, so they did formally approve one. Um, but um, in Vermont, it's delegated to the state and the state has approved such a project. So next slide. So what they said in their letter, what the EPA said was, if you do burst the pipe, it becomes subject to NESHEP. So NESHEP is a federal regulation that was required to be developed by the Clean Air Act. It does not provide an ad adaption for technology development and it literally requires an act of Congress to change. So it makes pipe bursting of AC pipe difficult, but not impossible. So there's three questions that are asked when um, determining if NESHEP applies. So it applies if the pipe is, if you're working on over 260 feet of pipe. Um, it applies if the asbestos content is greater than 1%. In AC pipe, it can be up to 12%. And then it applies if it is RACM. So will the pipe be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder? So EPA believes that AC pipe that has undergone the mechanical process of pipe bursting should be subject to NESHAP because of their statement that burst AC pipe is RACM, regulated asbestos containing material. If it was just asbestos containing material, it would not require NESHAP compliance. So there is resistance at the federal level due to the unclear application of NESHAP. Um, 
and states can vary with regulation practice. However, a majority of the states do adhere to EPA's determination. Luckily, Vermont did not. So, next one. Um, so, why does the EPA strongly recommend alternatives versus compliance with NESHAP? NESHAP requires a site to be considered an active waste site for one year following the completion of work, and then it becomes an inactive waste site. So this comes with a lot of requirements. So an active waste site, you have to provide notice to EPA, which is actually just a form that you fill out and send into them. Um, you can have no visible emissions. So this is the no dust producing. Um, control of public access, which in the case of a water main project, um, they, uh, it, it's actually very easy to do. Control of public access would be a natural barrier, warning signs and a fence, or six inches of cover with non-ACM material every day. So in our case, the pipe is under five to six feet of cover. So we have that taken care of. Packaging, transporting in accordance with federal and state regulations, and record keeping. Once it becomes an inactive waste site, again, no visible emissions, so no dust, control of access, um, so the pipe is, the, the burst AC fragments, which is, that's the hazardous waste, um, has five to six feet of soil over top of it. Um, there is a 45 day uh, prior notification uh, before excavating or disturbing any of this material. Um, however, we did actually have that come up in Bells Falls where there was a sewer main that needed to be repaired. Um, they're actually gonna be doing it in a few weeks. And, um, we just contacted the state and said it's a sewer main, it's an emergency project, and, and they waived the 45 days. Um, and then within 60 days of becoming inactive, which is one year after the last pipe bursting activity, you have to file a deed notation in the land records. So this is the big, that was the big sticking point for pipe bursting, is because most of the time it happens in a public right of way and there is no deed for public right of way. So we go to the next one. Um, just an example, everybody knows, everybody has an idea of what an active hazardous waste site looks like. So those are those two pictures on the top there. And the bottom picture is what a pipe bursting site looks like. So they're very different, um, but unfortunately NESHAP puts them in the same category. Um, you can basically ignore everything except the, the rightmost column, Vermont, on this one. Um, so all of the states are fairly similar, but um, they all require notification uh, and, al and allow for an alternative work procedure. So that's what we use here in Vermont is the alternative work procedure because it doesn't fall under any of the um, Vermont uh, asbestos uh, regulations as they're written. Um, so this is something that's uh, it actually doesn't need to be submitted until until 10 days prior to the project starting construction. Um, so the way we approached it on in Bells Falls is we actually worked with the Department of Health ahead of time, submitted the alternative work practice procedure, and um, got a uh, preliminary approval from them. They won't actually issue their um, final approval or their permit until you have an asbestos abatement contractor, which you don't get until after you bid the project. Um, so it's a little bit different in that you can't get the permit before you bid. Um, state notification here, so we talked about 260 feet for, um, for triggering NESHAP. In Vermont, um, you have to notify the state if you're working on more than 10 feet of AC pipe. Um, they do require the abatement contractor. Um, that's actually who has to get the permit. They did require the negative exposure assessment in Bells Falls. Um, that was done on uh, some work in um, Florida, um, but they uh, did not accept the Florida uh, negative exposure assessment. They wanted one done here in Vermont. So there has been one done here in Vermont now. It was done in Bells Falls. So I am hoping to get them to waive that requirement. Um, and then there's air monitoring, which 
um, the guys that are working on this, the, the, the operator of the equipment who's down in the trench, he'll wear an air monitor. Some of the other um, staff will wear air monitors. And they test those afterwards to see um, if there was any release of asbestos fibers. Um, landfill regulations, the state of Vermont does not require, does not consider um, buried asbestos to be a landfill. Um, so that is not an issue here. And in Vermont, you can see there's only been two previous determinations in the Northeast. Massachusetts said no, and Vermont said yes. So we go to the next one. Um, so how do we achieve regulatory compliance? Under NESHAP, we have to get acknowledgement of the process from all parties. So that is um, you know, the water department, the permitting agencies, the landowner, which in this case um, is the town and VTRANS um, for the state roads. The pipe is installed with trace wire and GPS located. So we actually will have the contractor uh, trace out the pipe paint it out on the ground after it's installed and then survey it. So we have an actual survey of where the pipe is. And of course the asbestos material is right around the pipe. Um, the trace wire that we use is specifically made for pipe bursting. Um, and we pull two wires just in case one breaks. The, um, the deed notation, since there is no deed for public right of way, the select board can issue a resolution that notes the location and quantity of buried asbestos and it just gets filed in land rec records with the record drawings. Um, and that's how we uh, notate the land records. Um, and then of course, no visible emissions and, and the control of access, that's easily um, achieved by burying the pipe six feet in the ground. The Vermont regulations, um, require the abatement contractor to be on site during bursting activities. Um, section six procedures for all non-bursting. So that's just keeping the pipe wet. Don't cut it with mechanical equipment, um, you know, properly dispose of it. And then the negative exposure assessment and the air monitoring. Um, and again, I'm going to try and get, try and um, get the negative exposure assessment eliminated from, for this project. No promises, but I'm gonna try. So on the next, so this is, um, I just wanted to provide the results from our Bells Falls project on the air monitoring. Um, so the, the one on the left is the time weighted average. And um, the taller bar there is the OSHA permissible exposure limit. That is 0.1. That's what OSHA says is allowed for um, asbestos fiber release. And what we saw in Bells Falls, the maximum of all samples collected was 0 0.005. So well below the exposure limit. Is that particles per billion or per million? It Let's is see. fibers per cubic centimeter. Oh, okay. And then the, the uh, chart on the right is the excursion limit, which OSHA allows for one. The permissible exposure limit is one. And our monitoring, the maximum of all samples collected was 0 0.045. Um, and then the Vermont regulations require 0 0.01 fibers per cubic centimeter in the air sample for final clearance and all of our samples were lower than that. In Bells Falls, we were also required to do a water test after the pipe was in, uh, the new pipe was installed in the service. Um, that was required by the drinking water division and there were no detectable asbestos fibers in the water. Up one more, or oh, maybe two more, there. Um, so in comparison to open trench, the typical uh, um, replacement method, um, the project that we did in Bells Falls, this, that's what this chart is, is summarizing. Um, it, it showcased the cost and time savings with pipe bursting, as well as several other social and environmental benefits. Um, it was more cost effective than conventional open trench. Uh, we actually were able to compare this um, with a, we had, a, we had an excellent comparison. There was a, another project that was bid at the same time 
It was a similar sized project. It was the same contractor, general contractor, doing the work. Um, they were both in southern Vermont. If you consider Bellis Falls to be southern Vermont, which it, it's, not as south, it's not as far south as you guys, but <laughs> um, it is still in southern Vermont. Uh, and um, our co cost comparison was actually a little bit conservative because we, um, the project we were comparing against had smaller pipe sizes than what we were using in Bells Falls. So in comparison to that project, when we look at per foot cost, we saw a 26% reduction in construction cost. The um, reduction in construction duration, we were able to compare that because we had open trench and pipe bursting on our Bells Falls project. So we were able to look at the production from that same contractor for both methods. We saw 70% reduction in construction duration, 75% reduction in pavement disturbance, and an 85% reduction in excavation. And then um, we saw 95% reduction in AC pipe waste to the landfill. Um, in that particular case, we would have had to go in the same alignment as the existing pipe, and so all of it would have had to been removed from the trench and disposed of. Um, so it was environmentally superior to removing the old pipe. It reduced the carbon footprint, less waste, and minimized the release of asbestos fibers. Now I do have to say that here we have a lot more services than we did in Bells Falls. That was a transmission main. We had nine services over, um, I think it was, we burst I think like 4,400 feet and it was nine services. So there's a lot more services here. So you won't see quite the reduction in excavation and pavement disturbance, but you will see um, a significant reduction over open trench. Um, just uh, on funding in the schedule, um, the town applied for the 2021 construction priority list for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. A uh, draft list has been issued and will be finalized in July. This list prioritizes projects based on a point system. The project is just outside the fundable range. It's actually one project away from the fundable range right now. However, historically, some projects within the fundable range are bypassed as they are not ready to proceed. So this allows the state to offer funding to projects that are initially ranked outside the fundable range. And so we are moving forward with design and permitting to ensure that your project is ready to proceed. Um, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund or offers low interest loans for water system improvements. Interest rates typically range from, uh, well, they range from zero to 3%, and terms range from 30 to 40 years. The project is currently at 90% design, and the drinking water permit application and environmental report have been submitted. The remaining permits to apply for include the VTRANS permit for work in the state right of way, railroad crossing approval, and the asbestos permit, which happens after the bidding is done. A bond vote would occur, I believe, in March. 2022 and once a bond uh, once a positive bond vote is received the project can move into construction um, construction needs to be completed by the end of 2023 due, due to the paving project um, but we would recommend 2022 if possible and then there's also some other funding options um, that might come about with stimulus funding um, if that comes through um, and so stimulus funding is for ready, uh, it's for shovel ready projects. So we're going to do what we can to get you shovel ready, um, get you in the best position for funding as possible. So Excellent. I do have the plans on here. If anybody wants to see them, they're kind of hard to read on the screen. Um, and I, it, I'm not really gonna be able to describe exactly what the impacts are going to be in various places because it's all going to depend on where those pits are excavated and that's going to depend on what the contractor decides and how far they can do their bursts um so any questions um, would you please explain uh how people are going to continue to have water service while you're going out right outside your house sure so what we need to do is, uh, since we are using the same pipe that currently brings water, um, we will put in temporary water. So um, it's going to vary in different parts of the system, and we're working on the details of that plan right now. Um, from the North Bennington connection to Cleveland Ave, uh, we would have an 8-inch minimum uh, temporary water pipe. 
um, that, that would be able to provide the same flow that you currently have. Um, we could use Cleveland Ave to serve um, basically the, the rest of the system and backfeed down 7A. Um, and then as we work up 7A, we'll have to kind of do temporary water to work around our, our work area. Um, we try to leave as much flexibility in that plan as possible, allow, allow the contractor to um, do what might work best for them. Um, because they might have pipe on hand that they want to use and, and maybe it's a specific length. So we really try to be flexible on it, but there will be some requirements. But the point is people will not be without water. Correct. Okay. People will not be without. There will be temporary shutdowns. Um, usually we limit those to four hours. Um, so that'll be when we're connecting temporary water and when we're making the final connection to. from the house to the water or from the building to the water system. I think we need to say that currently there is no asbestos leaking into the water from the pipe that we're aware of. Because that's been tested. Right? Yeah. Yeah, there's no issue with that now. No. This is just to prevent the collapse of the current pipe because it's past its useful lifespan. Yeah. yeah. By a considerable amount. Especially by the time we get to the third phase of this 20 years from now. Yeah. I think it's also fair to say that we've got to borrow the money for this and usually the person lending us the money is quite concerned if we go for a project that uses the highest cost pipe and the most expensive way to do it too. Um, they, the borrower, the uh, lenders like the fact that we go with a cheaper price uh, trying to do it. Is that right? When, when it comes to get the best value. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's the best to keep the rates down for the consumer, too. Sure. Mm -hmm. yes. Especially with ARPA money and other money available, the whole bond bank thing is kind of a question mark at the moment, depending on when they finalize what funds will be available. Yeah. And this HDPE pipe is a 100-year pipe, you were saying? Yes. Yes, it is, yeah. Dave? Yeah, I've got a question or a couple of questions. Uh, David Durfee and I live on 7A. Um, possibly, I live on this side, the east side, mm -hmm. and I suspect the water line goes down the other side. Is that correct? That is correct. It goes along the west side. Yeah, okay. So um, the main, the, the, the connection originally is down a little bit further south, I think, of Cleveland Avenue. Mm -hmm. will, will we be starting, will the, will the pit be like right where that connection is, or will be some of that main left in place? Uh, how much of it is going to be uh, burst? We're going to start right at the town's uh, meter pit. Okay. So we'll start right from there, um, and uh, there'll be a uh, pit there. Um, and so anything between the meter pit and wherever we're bursting will be put back as the HDPE pipe. And then does it, it runs up, it's not under the travel route, is it going to be under the sidewalk or is it between the sidewalk and the travel lane? So to the best of our knowledge, because AC pipe cannot be located <laughs> unless you dig it up, yeah. um, based on the valve locations, um, to the best of our knowledge, it is towards the back of the sidewalk. It kind of varies a little bit. So it's either under the back of the sidewalk or it's behind the sidewalk um, in most areas. I, I don't believe it's in the road so at all So behind the sidewalk, I mean? To uh, the west. To the west, okay. Yes. Right. And when the road then is paved, and whenever that is next summer or two years from now, uh, will that involve digging as deep as the, as the new water main? No, they'll, um, so they're going to remove the concrete road base. So there's a, I don't know how much pavement there is right now. Um, I'm going to guess about six inches. And then there's about 12 inches of concrete underneath that. Um, so they'll dig that up. The water mains are five to six feet deep. So they'll okay. go like maybe two feet. So they won't be disturbed at all then by that? No. Okay. Uh, and all right, I guess that's it for my questions for the moment. Thanks. Comments? 
or anything? Uh, I have one question. If there's been <clears throat> some talk of a, like a public sewer system in Shaftesbury for decades, I guess, but with, with the stimulus money possibly coming, it's been kind of talked about again. If you were to pipe burst, it would be very difficult, I guess, to come back later and lay a sewer pipe next to that without opening up the can of worms of all the broken up asbestos being there. Is that correct? I mean, um, technically, yes, but if you were to put a sewer main in, you'd have to keep it 10 feet away from the water main. Oh, okay, so that would be... That, yeah, that's a separate regulation. Gotcha. Right. Um, so you, you actually wouldn't get into it anyway. Okay. Except at crossings. Cool. Nobody's... No, no, one, no one's on. Come in. Okay. I'll be a little one. Okay. <laughs> So, I guess without any more questions or anything, no other comments or anything? You happy? Or as much as... <laughs> oh, I did have one other question. The, the Bellows Falls project, how recently was that done? That was uh, done in 2018. Okay, and that's the first and only project in Vermont? In New England. In New England. Okay. Or in the Northeast. And there was one in Massachusetts that was not... They actually were, they literally had the bursting equipment on site, ready to go, and the state showed up and shut them down. Um, they have, they're governed by an air board, two air boards. So they have a Western air board and an Eastern air board. The Western air board said okay, but then the Eastern air board said no. <laughs> like the day they were going to do it. Um, but there has been, uh, Florida's been a big um, proponent of this. They're actually the ones that worked with the EPA to get the first, um, well, they're the ones that have been really pushing the EPA to get approval, but um, they did the first, I believe, in, in the U.S., um, and they have done, I want to say, over 30 miles of it down there. Um, and it's being done in a handful of states across the country right now, um, and more and more are jumping on. You said there's 600,000 miles of, of this out there? Throughout North America, yeah. And how much of it is, is uh, reaching the end of its uh, usable life? Pretty much all of it. <laughs> okay, so th so there's going to be a, a, a gold rush to get. Yes. <laughs> okay. So in your experience, I mean, the worst case scenarios, how long does it take once you, the project's up, ramped up and going? I mean, I guess I'm looking for distance per day. Sure. So what we found in Bells Falls was um, their poles were about, we were using PVC, um, and their poles were about, I would say, four to 500 feet. A day. Um, well, that was per pole. So what per they would do pole. is they would fuse all the pipe together. They would get their pits dug the day before. Um, they had temporary water through the whole project area. So they would get their pits dug. Um, and in the morning, they'd set the bursting machine down. They'd dig three pits. So they'd set the bursting machine down in the middle one. They would pull from one direction. They'd pay out their rods in the other direction while they were pulling. So instead of taking them off yeah. when, they, when they're pulling back, they would just let them keep going yeah. into the next pipe. The next, yeah. And then they just disconnected the machine, turned it around, and pulled back the other way hmm. all in one day. It's a very efficient way to do it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sometimes they did two pulls a day, sometimes it was one pull a day, just how their schedule worked out. So they can really cover some distance yes. though in a day. That's good. That's very good to know. So at every 40 feet, the pipes are fused together and not, and not bolted or screwed Correct. or anything else? Yeah. That's a friction fit? Press fit? Yeah, it's it's friction fit. It's butt welded fusion well, okay. together. Yeah. Oh, it is. So it basically eliminates joints. There are no joints in the pipe anymore. Okay. Right. It's completely fused together. Yep. Okay. Very good. <coughs> with, with plastic wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How thick is the wall? I mean, like. So HDPE, um, we do need to upsize it to maintain your eight-inch um, AC hydraulic capacity. So we're gonna have to go to a ten-inch HDPE. The wall thickness is it's pretty. I mean, it's substantial on an HDPE for pipe. For a 10-inch OD for an 8-inch ID, yes. yeah, that is the thick wall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, in, you're going to end up with a larger ID than you have now, um, but if we didn't upsize, you'd have a smaller inside diameter than, yeah. than now. Um, so we'll upsize to 10-inch, and that will give you um, 
that will give you more hydraulic capacity than you have now. But if but we didn't, reduce you would the have pressure. Less. No, it won't, it'll, it'll actually, um, it's not going to change your pressure too much, but it'll slightly increase it. Oh, well, that's good. Yes. So we're, we're um, reducing the head loss in the pipe. Okay. So. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, PVC has a has a thinner wall. It's it's a stronger material, so it can do thinner wall, and that's why we can still use an eight inch. But when we go to HDP, it's a it's a much thicker wall. So the PVC is, is qualifies for hydraulic then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What's the life expectancy? Yeah, it's a hundred year as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah the only um, one of the big deterrents to PVC is what's called rapid crack propagation. Um, so what PVC can do is it cracks linear along the pipe. And when you put in a C900 pipe, it's a 20 foot stick. It has a bell joint on it. Um, and so that crack would only go 20 feet. When you fuse it together and you make fusible PVC, if it does crack, crack it's the just fuse, gonna yeah. go. Oh, really? Yeah, it'll crack right through the, fu right through the fuse joints. Okay. Um, so in Bellas Falls, what we did was we put mechanical joints in at every, every pit we had. We put in a mechanical joint, a solid sleeve, to oh, stop the crack yeah, if yeah. it happened. Okay. Um, it's it's not super common, but it can happen, um, and it doesn't happen with HDPE. It doesn't. No. Okay. Is there? We don't really have earthquakes here, but <clears throat> if there was, is the HDPE preferred if you were to have like a seismic event or something like that? Would that I would say yeah. It's a very flexible, flexible pipe. Yeah. Very flexible. You don't have earthquakes, but it's going to take a lot of grumbling from the <laughs> rough track. Only a few feet away from it. I was going to say we get a lot of land shift just in the you know the seasons when they. We've had a couple the like twos on the Richter scale over the years. We have. <laughs> Every now and then. Well, I guess without any anything further, I guess if somebody wants to make a motion, we close the water board meeting. Okay. So make a motion. Okay. Good. Sorry, Good. Joe. Good. Second by Tony. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Chris, thank you so much for thank taking you. the thank time you. to come thank here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.